This is a Mac SE30. For whatever reason, it's one of the more sought after compact Macintosh machines, probably because it's the most powerful of the bunch. This one's seen better days, but I think I can fix it up. Before I do anything else with this machine, the first thing I want to do is clean it up. There's scuffs, paint marks, and a handful of dents in the plastic, although I'm not going to worry so much about those. I usually just start with some water and a magic eraser, and then I just go to town on some of these scuff marks. There are plenty of number on this computer, but thankfully they come off without issue. For the seams on top, I use a toothbrush and some 91% alcohol to clean it up. It gets the job done nicely. There's a few more almost mold-like spots elsewhere on the case, though thankfully it doesn't seem to be actual mold, as that would come off best with a solvent like ammonia or bleach, and I'd like to avoid that as much as possible. Now this paint mark on the back is kind of tricky. First I tried the eraser, and that didn't do anything at all. Uh, the alcohol brush also didn't do much. I felt it with my fingernail a bit, and realized that it felt a lot like acrylic paint, which really only comes off with abrasives. I wasn't willing to use sandpaper for fear of damaging the label, so I resolved to lightly scrape at it with a screwdriver. This worked great, and after a few passes of scraping it to loosen up the paint polymer, followed by some touch-ups with other tools, we're back in shape. The last exterior cleaning step is to clean the monitor glass. This is basically a perfect use case for Windex, and unsurprisingly it cleans up perfectly. And that pretty much sums up the cleaning step. There are still a few smooth looking spots in the plastic, but it's clean enough for now that it isn't gross to the touch and that's really what I was headed for. Let's see what happens when we hit the switch. Well, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is that it works well enough that the boot ROM is loading and it's asking for a startup disk, which means that the damage to the internal parts, if any, is probably very minimal. The bad news is that there's no boot chime. It should have sounded like this, but it didn't. The lack of a boot chime could indicate something as simple as a speaker failure, but as speakers are basically just inductors driven directly by the logic board in these machines, that's very unlikely. The most likely problem is the age-old vintage Mac meme, failed capacitors. The thing about capacitors is that the longer we wait to change them, the more likely that irreversible damage has already happened to the circuit boards inside, and uh, we really don't want that because repairing traces on something as new as this machine can be a bit of a pain. It's not impossible to do, but definitely not my favorite task. Alright, enough screwing around, let's get to fixing this. I'll throw down a nice plush cloth for it to sit on so the screen doesn't get scratched. Then I'll use my long boy Torx T15 screwdriver to pop it open. The bucket slides right off the back. We can remove this metal foil RF shield from the bottom and the internals are ready to come out. Before we do anything, this bare CRT needs to get discharged. It's always better to treat all CRTs as being live since working around them can be a lethal hazard on the order of kilovolts. Alligator clip to the screwdriver, then to the dag ground on top of the tube, then we slip it under the anode cap here and touch the metal pin in the center. There was no pop sound, so we're good to go. Let's unhook the anode cap so it's safer to work with. We'll start by removing this expansion card. Hmm. It's an Ethernet card, but it's Novell branded. I didn't know Novell made Ethernet gear that's this early, let alone for Max. Neat. Now I pop out the power cable, floppy, and SCSI connectors. We need to lay it face down to pull out the board, so while we're at it, let's also remove these screws from the Ethernet backplate. Alright, with that out, we can slide out the logic board. You only have to slide it out about an inch or two forward before it can be pulled out, and out it comes. Wow, uh, this thing has a ton of RAM in it. I'm just going to leave it in place. It doesn't really get in the way. We've got several surface mount capacitors here. Four around the audio and serial ports, three at the power connector, one by the PDS slot, and then one down here. There's also one right here that I missed when I was counting them. Throw down the anti-static mat, and let's get to work. See all this gunk tarnishing around the ICs? That's the capacitor goo. Leaks all over the board. The longer it sits on here, the more problems we'll have, so we need to clean this off now, and thoroughly. First things first, alcohol and a toothbrush. Scrubbing the absolute sh** out of these spots is the most effective first line for, at the very least, dislodging any goo that's really stuck on there. We're going to do this around every problem area the caps could leak onto. In theory, the whole board could have it, but we're really going to focus the hardest in the area surrounding the caps themselves first. Okay, with that initial clean done, let's remove all these caps. 
I've got a flush cutters here, and while I'm not going to cut all the way through these guys, look at the amount of play this has on the base. It really shouldn't wiggle around like that. That means the capacitors have structurally failed enough that you really don't have to pull hard to remove them. I use just a bit of pressure, not enough to cut through, but enough to dig into the cap, and some gentle lifting, and it pops right off. No lifted pads, no damage to the board. And best of all, unlike using an iron or hot air, we don't heat the capacitor goo to the point of evaporating. If you've ever been around someone who's recapping a Mac and you've smelled the smell, we'll do the same over here. I swear I'm not lying about how easy this is to lift off. In past recap jobs, I've had to cut all the way through the caps, and actually this tiny one here does need to be chopped to come off, but I can just use the pliers to pull out what's left of the can off the board. Then the base just disintegrates with the slightest touch of the screwdriver. There are some legs left behind here, but we'll deal with that later. Lastly, we want to cut these big axial caps off the board. I leave the legs behind because sometimes I find it troublesome to completely desolder the big ones, so we can leave them in place to solder the new caps too after the fact. Now to really get rid of all of the cap goo, I like to use this stuff. It's called Safe Wash. It's not really common here in the US, but I'll link to a supplier in the description so you can get some for yourself. Not sponsored, I just like the stuff. It's basically a detergent mousse? Mouse? Mousse? Anyway, it foams up and really gets into some of the cracks and crevices where the capacitor goo likes to hide. It's not completely foolproof, but it's given amazing results in the past. Just spray it on the board, let it foam up, and scrub using the brush on the nozzle. I end up more or less covering the board with it to clean things up, and then we just leave it for a while. This is a time lapse over about 45 minutes. You're really only supposed to rinse it after about two minutes, but I want it to be thorough. Now we just pour some distilled water over it and give it a good rinse, and then we let it soak for another half hour. The detergent, along with the cap goo and any dust or flux on the board, will also dissolve into the water using the detergent. One more rinse to get it all, and we're more or less done cleaning. Just gotta shake out all the excess water here. I set my oven to 170 Fahrenheit, which is the lowest it'll go. Then I put the board onto a baking sheet with some bolts to hold it off the surface of the pan. Thirty minutes later, we pull out a nice clean board. Now for the fun part. We'll clean up the workspace and pull out the soldering iron, and we have a nice clean board to work on now. We'll also need some alcohol to clean more with, of course. The recap, I'll be using these AVX solid tantalum capacitors. I know there's a lot of discourse surrounding what type of capacitors to use, but these are what I have on hand, and they don't leak fishy smelling acid on the board, so that's what we'll use. There's a couple of ways you can do this. The most straightforward is just to apply some fresh solder to the now clean pad, and we're good to go. The solder I'm using has some flux built into it, so it flows better, so we'll want to scrub the excess off after finishing this cap. There we go, that's one down. It's going to be mostly just this from here on, but with a few detours here and there we'll get to in a minute. The second capacitor goes on just the same as the first one. When it's done, we get a nice shiny solder joint on both sides, indicating a solid connection. Now those are the easiest two caps, so we'll move on to the cluster beside the audio circuitry. I use the soldering iron to wipe away those leftover legs from the one we chopped, and then solder down the replacement cap just as before. We'll pretend some solder onto the other pads. C7 over here was a particularly leaky one, so I'm going to pre-tin it, and I'm actually going to remove the solder I put there to help suck away any leftover solder that might be harboring some hidden corrosive goo. We repeat this a couple times with flux and braid, and brushing until the pads look nice and clean. Now, remember those ICs that looked all corroded? Even with the detergent and all the alcohol, there's still a little bit of corrosive goo deep down in the solder, so we need to clean it up. I tried using this wick, but I ended up really dissatisfied because it wasn't sucking away any of the solder. So I switched to this MG Chemical Super Wick, which did a much better job of heating and leveling the solder that was already there. Iterating a bit with the alcohol flux and more solder, and we get a cleaner picture. While not perfect, it should stave off any further problems in this area for now. Now we can solder C3, C4, and C5, which should go on just like the rest.
As I did these, I noticed that pre-tinning both of the pads would sometimes cause the caps to go on really crooked. You can see C4 here was really bad, and I ended up removing and cleaning this cap and then trying again to get a better mount, which worked fine. Now we can go back over here to C7 and do the same, and this should give us our boot shine back. For the power decoupling caps, we do the whole solder, desolder, clean number again, just to make sure we get rid of any latent corrosion from the old solder. C8 had a leftover leg in the positive terminal, so we just brush that off with a hot iron. Then we pre-tin just one side of each cap this time around to get a less crooked joint. C8 was just still a tiny bit crooked, but it's not too bad, so I'll just leave it. Now, lastly, we have C13, which needs a bit of solder, desolder, alcohol cleaning too. Now, around this time, I noticed that this little transistor here, Q3, had some corrosion on its pads. I desoldered, cleaned, and resoldered both sides of the transistor one at a time to clean it up. We'll skip past C13 since we've seen it a million times now, and for the big axial caps, I'll just clip the leads down and thoroughly solder them to the existing leads from the old caps. Once those are mounted, that's it. We are done. We have a completely recapped logic board. Just gonna do a quick detergent pass here around the capacitors to remove any latent flux left behind from my handiwork here. And then we'll do a quick water rinse. Follow that up with an alcohol immersion rinse. And we'll leave it to dry so we can test it. And then, off camera, the unthinkable happened. <sighs> I usually smoke test things before showing them, but never literally. Having done this for the better half of a decade, not once have I seen a fresh chip tantalum capacitor explode like this. But what could cause this? Well, installing them backwards can, but I have photo evidence that I didn't do that. Over voltage can cause that too, so what about that? The SE30 schematic shows C9 as decoupling the negative 12 volt power rail, which is this little green wire here, so let's check that first. I've got the multimeter out here, and if we probe this line and flip the power, hmm, it's negative 10 volts. That's not ideal, but it doesn't support the idea of an over voltage failure. Maybe I just got unlucky? Regardless, for safety's sake, we should check all the voltages just to make sure we aren't at risk of another failure. Here's 3 volts. Here's minus 5 volts. Here's plus 12 volts. Okay, well that doesn't give me confidence in an over voltage failure. Whatever, let's just get this crispy capacitor off the board. I desoldered from both sides to ensure it's fully disconnected, and using the tweezers I, uh, oh. Okay, this thing is literally charcoal. Let's just get a firmer grip on the non-burnt part and desolder it fully. Well, there's some metal debris here. Uh, let's scrub it off to make sure there's nothing left. Alright, that's a bit better. None of the traces look burnt, so we're going to install a new capacitor. This one is a larger capacitor with the same ratings, but it's by Kemet, whom I've always used up to this point. The other capacitors you see here are by AVX, and while I'm not knocking the AVX engineers, I gotta say this doesn't give me confidence in their capacitors compared to my lack of failures with the Kemets. Let's clean it up and make sure the pad isn't damaged and that the cap is truly welded down. Alright, moment of truth. Love God, please work. Please. Oh, thank fuck. We're back to normal. The Kemet capacitor that I used to replace the bad one is designed with an internal fuse that prevents it from blowing up. If I use tantalum capacitors in the future, probably gonna stick to these. I wasn't originally planning on recapping the power supply and CRT driver in this video, but that little explosion scared me straight. Let's get this power supply and board out. First we'll do the CRT driver, so we remove the power supply module first. To desolder the caps, we have to remove this paper safety backing with all these little plastic rivets. You can actually see where the high voltage of the flyback transformer actually singed the paper a little bit in this spot. Hmm, yeah, that's not frightening at all. 
The analog board has these frustrating hot glue blobs holding all of the cabs in place. We'll need to pluck that off with pliers and razor knives so we can properly desolder them. There we go. Time to break out the iron and braid once again. First, I want to tackle this cap at the top of the board. There we go. Popped right out. This particular rating and size of capacitor isn't actually manufactured anymore. So I've had to use an equivalent metal film capacitor instead. It should work fine since the rating is the same despite the different chemistry. It takes a bit of bending and forcing into place, but once it's soldered in, it's nice and snug and we can tackle the rest, which are much easier by comparison. The rest of these are all super duper straightforward. Wick away as much solder as possible, hold the iron to the pads as I pull the capacitor out, pluck out the old cap, put in the new cap, solder it down. Repeat over, over, and, and, over, and, and over, and over, and over, and over, and over. Skipping ahead, I've got the power supply open, and there's this enormous capacitor on board. As with the film capacitor on the driver board, this type of cap isn't actually made anymore, so I've got the closest equivalent I could find in the big chunky replacement capacitor department. For those paying attention, you might already see the problem. The footprint doesn't match up. The old cap on it has different feet on it than the replacement. I did try bending the leads a bunch to make it work, but it just wasn't enough. So I resorted to doing something I hate doing. In this case, I drilled out one of the holes a tiny bit, just enough to fit the new capacitor leads. Given that this cap handles high voltage, I had to make sure that the new cap not only fit into place, but was mechanically stable and has good conductivity to the traces on the other side. To check conductivity, I worked a small wire under the capacitor and touched it to the leg of the drilled out hole side of the cap and did a resistance test between the lead of the cap and the pad on the opposite side. Thankfully, most of these aren't hot glued in place, so it's just a lot of desoldering, pulling, placing, resoldering over and over and, and over, over and over and, and over. over. Honestly, I've come to appreciate surface mounted capacitors a lot more in recent years because at least those pose a challenge. These guys are so straightforward and simple that it's frankly a little boring to do at this point. At this point, I'm handling this giant cluster of capacitors on the business end of the board where the majority of the hard work is. It ended up being easier to just mass desolder them and mass resolder them since I had all the caps labeled in little bags and I didn't have to worry about getting the values wrong. All right, that's all the caps. Let's get it back in the case. In the middle of reassembling, Freya decided to literally climb my shoulder and leap onto the workbench. You're lucky you're cute, you little shit. I want to power it on while it's still open to make sure nothing explodes. Okay, no explosions. That's a good sign. Let's check the voltages. Hmm. 12 volt rail is only 7 volts. That's low. Lower than the 10 volts from earlier, but it could just be open circuit voltage. The rest looks good. Let's throw a resistor across that 7 volts and see what it does. I use a 1K resistor here to test with. There we go. Much better. Let's button it up and get back in the case. Before we do that, I'm going to really quickly re-glue all of these capacitors. That might seem like a weird thing to do after I complained about it so much, but I have a feeling they were glued down to help with mechanical strength since this board gets mounted vertically. Hot glue comes off easily, so I'll just commit to it. Let's put the foil shield back on and get this board mounted back in the case. It was at this moment I realized you're supposed to mount the analog board in first, then screw down the power supply. Ugh, okay. Fine. There we go. Okay. Time for a dry run to make sure nothing explodes when it's all put back together. We'll just plug it in, switch on the power strip, and uh, well, here goes nothing. Oh, f me, not again. Why isn't it turning on? What the actual f did I just screw up this time? Oh. Oh god, you gotta be kidding. It wasn't actually plugged in. Oh, I swear this isn't a comedy bit. It was actually so nervous I forgot to plug it in. Okay, alright, alright, one more try. Let's, let's see what happens. And there it is. Okay, the hardest part is behind us. Let's do something fun with this machine. 
Now I could just throw a floppy emulator at it and boot it and be done, but I want to be thorough and put an actual solid state drive in here. Now old SCSI SSDs don't really exist, so we'll be using this blue SCSI kit. I could go on a spiel on what this does, but basically it lets me use an SD card as a hard drive and it costs about 40 bucks. That's all that needs to be said. It uses an STM32 microcontroller to do all the hard work, so we'll start by soldering these headers to it so we have some of the hardest part done. Next, we'll move on to these diodes. And then the termination resistors. If you don't know what I mean when I say SCSI termination, just consider yourself lucky. That, along with all of SCSI's other respective pitfalls, are honestly topics for another video. We'll solder the SCSI connector next. Then we'll throw on this STM controller, followed by some jumper headers. and a couple of resistors for the status LEDs. All right, there we go. Pops right into this little blue mount, which we can use to safely put inside the housing of the computer. I've got a little book of System 7 SD cards ready to go for the occasion, so we'll just pick any random one. They should be all fail safe in case we need to diagnose some issue. Then we can plug in the SCSI cable on the motherboard side and then into the blue SCSI. Now all that's left to do is switch it on again, and we'll see if it boots. Hmm, it's not supposed to happen. Okay, let's try a different SD card. Same image, different card. Nope, that didn't work either. Hmm. Okay, let's try an actual boot floppy with System 7 on it. These are actually for a Mac LC, but that's not important. They should be regular system boot disks. All right, here's disk one. Pop it in and power it on and see what happens. Hmm. You know, I don't think I've ever gotten that disk to boot before, come to think of it. I've never really tested it. Uh, it could be bad. Let's try the utilities boot disk and see if that works. At least it'll show us if it can see the hard drive. Oh, hey, happy Mac icon. That means it worked. Now we can see if... Wait, what? You gotta be fucked. Okay, forget floppy disks. I just noticed the SCSI cable is kind of twisted around. That could be affecting the quality of the connection. Let's fix that. Ugh, work with me, please. I'm starting to run out of ideas here. Okay, forget floppies. What about an emulated floppy? I've got my emulator plugged into the back and let's see if it boots. Nope. Oh, wait. Apparently, I have to update the firmware on the floppy emu. Let's go ahead and take care of that. I broke the floppy emu. I'll email Steve Chamberlain and see if maybe he knows I fixed the floppy emu. And hey, it actually booted to a disk utility image. Unfortunately, it still doesn't see the hard disk, so this doesn't count in my book. Since we know a boot floppy can't see the SCSI disk either, that narrows the problem down to either the blue SCSI or the computer SCSI controller. I haven't actually tried giving the blue SCSI more power yet, and I don't have any spare small power connectors, so I decided to jury-rig this, this janky header wire contraption from the power header down all the way to the Molex cable off the analog board. And in a twist that surprised the shit out of me, it actually booted the blue SCSI. Ha, huh, first try. I quickly whipped up a better power connector with a Molex splitter I had lying around, but y'all have seen enough build montages for one video, so I'll, I'll skip past that. Why don't we get back to actually playing around with this machine? Start simple. How about some good old missile command? Yeah, there we go. Nice and easy. Or, or not. Hmm. Hmm. I forgot I'm actually terrible at this game. Oh, Jesus Christ, that heated up quickly. Oh, only got three cities left. Ooh, close call there. Nope, no, 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 no. Oh, mm, mm, mm. Okay. Well, that's that then. Uh, maybe we can try something more passive, like a classic. 
Morgan Trail anyone? Let's see. I'll be any key. And here we'll put... Perfect. Independence. Start of any good dysentery journey. <laughs> I set the speed to grueling. Look how fast the little oxen go. Oh, look at the little legs. Coming up on the next waypoint here. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, hmm. Hmm. Sorry to hear about your mom. Hey, made it. Hmm, shame about your mom, though. A personal favorite. I try to run a SimCity game on every computer I get my hands on. Let's do, uh, hmm. Tokyo. I haven't seen the monster disaster in black and white. What the actual fuck was that? <laughs> is, this, is, that the, is that the monster sound? <laughs> oh god. <laughs> that was brilliant. Oh, can you imagine a can you imagine a kaiju movie where Godzilla goes to do his atomic breath and he just puts out this little God, that's great. Oh, I love this game. Oh, well, I think at this point that about wraps up this part of the project. There's actually a ton of other cool extra things I want to do, like making a hard drive sound emulator for it, or replacing the exhaust fan, or getting it sharing files between my other computers or repairing that fucking floppy drive. But at this point, we're almost half an hour in and that's pretty ridiculous. But if you made it this far, I hope you enjoyed the video. My plans for this channel are to make fun retro computing related projects and videos. I've been doing this for a few years as a hobby and I've been doing random casual video editing for, geez, I don't know, like 10 years maybe. Anyway, this is finally a chance for me to intersect those two things together. I'm planning to do a lot more than just vintage Apple stuff. So subscribe if you want, click the little stupid bell icon that everyone hates and hit the like button if you liked it. I'll see you in the next one.